Hello there, friends. What a pleasure to be together once again through this worship experience online. It is our prayer that the presence of God be with you. Today, God has something special for your life, and if you believe it, you can receive it. We invite you to prepare your heart, mind, and spirit to worship God and receive his love. Psalms 29, 2 says, Give glory to the Lord and worship him in his presence. So let's worship and get ready to receive something special from God. Happy Sunday, church. It's time to worship God with all of our heart and everything we got. So put your hands together like this and we're going we're gonna to praise him. Hey. Here we go. Sing it out. Trust in your name, Jesus. 
out. We thank the Lord for our worship team who does an amazing job leading us into the presence of God. Before we go into the message, we want to take this time to encourage you to be faithful in your giving, to be faithful in your tithes and offerings. We know that sometimes this part of the service can feel a little awkward, can feel a little unnecessary, but it's not. Giving to God is also part of our worship unto him. You know, what we do is a partnership. We get to partner with God in his mission. But you also get to partner with us as pastors. When we preach, as we share the gospel, as we help people, we're able to do it because you partner with us. And you know, I think you would agree with me that at La Iglesia, we are a church that loves to bless. We are a church that is spreading the gospel. We are a church that is helping people and sharing the good news of Jesus. So I want to encourage you to be faithful. I want to encourage you to be generous in your giving. Not because God needs it, but because you need it. You know, God asks that we give to him, not because he needs it, but because we need it. When we are generous, when we trust him, when we give to him, we declare that he is God and that our faith and hope is in him and not in our possessions. And when we have that kind of mindset, where our hope and our security and our joy is not in material things, but in God, God is able to bless us and give us more. So I want to encourage you to take this time. We know that the pandemic has hit many of us, but you would agree with me that God has been faithful, that God has provided for us, that God has continued to meet our needs. And I am a believer that God always meets more than our needs. That God always gives us more than we really need because God always gives us so that we can be a blessing to others. We want to remind you that there's various ways that you can give. You can give through our website. You can give by calling the office number. You can give through tax. You can give by coming in person and dropping your offerings in the mailbox that's found on Sherman Way. There's various ways to give. What you need is not a way, is a disposition. And I always tell people, especially those that have Jesus as their Lord, that he doesn't want something from them, that he wants something for them. And when we give, we position ourselves, not just to be used by God, but also to be blessed by God. So I pray that you would activate your faith and that you would partner with us and that you would partner with God in his mission to reach the world and that you would be generous in your giving. Let me pray for those that are going to give, and then we'll go into today's message. Heavenly Father, we give to you with joy. We don't give to you with fear because we know, Lord, that our hands, that our life is in your hands and that you are going to meet our needs even more than we can imagine, Lord. So we give, Lord, because we believe in your work. We believe, Father, in the work that you're doing through La Iglesia en el Camino. What a privilege it is to be able to give back to you and to partner, Lord, with the church that is doing such amazing work. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We trust a God that can do everything. A God that can make anything possible. I don't know if you agree with me today, but if you do, I want you to sing this song with me. Breaking my heart is slow. 
All right. Well, we want to welcome everybody. So whether this is your first time or we're your home church and you're with us regularly, we're so glad that you would join us for our online service. My name is Pastor Nestor Flores, and I'm one of the campus pastors. Today, we're going to continue our series, and we've titled today's message, Why Are You Angry? What do you say we pray before we go into God's Word? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. And we come before you, Lord, expecting you to speak to us, expecting you to, Lord, transform our thinking. We don't want this time to be a religious time. We don't just want to gain more information, but we want our lives to be changed. I thank you for everybody who's watching us, who's listening to my voice, that this time in your presence would be a blessing to their life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, you know, 2020 has definitely been a very um, different year. It's been a very difficult year with this pandemic, with all the negative stuff that's going on. And uh, difficult times tend to bring all kinds of different feelings into our lives. While there's been good things, good feelings that this pandemic has brought, there's been also a lot of negative feelings. And, and, and here's the thing, sometimes these negative feelings don't come one at a time. Many times they've come several at a time. And to make matters worse, we don't always know what to do with them. So that's why we're doing this series, because in our time together, we want to learn how to overcome these feelings. We want to go into God's word. We want to look to Jesus. We want to look to the example that he's left us and answer the question, how can we overcome these feelings? And, you know, we've titled our series, How Do You Feel?, and I, and I hope you've taken time to really answer that question because I believe there is a work that God wants to do. I believe that God wants to help you with your negative feelings. And in the past weeks, we've talked about what to do when we feel worried, when we feel fearful, when we feel overwhelmed, when we're anxious, and when we're depressed. If you missed any of those uh, sermons, any of those weeks, you can find them on our YouTube or Facebook page if you look for them. As I mentioned earlier, today we're going to continue on the topic of anger. And uh, I believe uh, it's one that we can all benefit from. And before we continue, let me ask you a question. Did you get angry this week? Did you get angry more than once? How did you deal with your anger? Especially if you heard last week's message. You know, last week we began our topic on, on anger by looking at a central truth. The Bible says that we shall know the truth and the truth will set us free. And I am believing that the Holy Spirit is at work. That he's working in your life, that he's working in your heart, that he's working in your kid's life, that he's working in your spouse, that he's working in the lives of those who are hearing this message, and that he's breaking chains, that he's breaking strongholds, that he's transforming minds. So I want to encourage you to open yourself up to his work, to let him move, to let him move in your life. Because let me tell you something, there is power in the work of the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that we need the Holy Spirit to change, one of the changes that he wants to make is that he wants to change this false belief, this myth regarding anger. And what is that myth? That myth is that anger can't be controlled. And the word of God tells us otherwise, tells us that uh, believing that anger can be controlled is not true. In fact, We've learned from the word of God and we looked at this big central truth last week. And that is that anger is a decision. Yes, anger is a decision. That means that you have power over anger, that you can exercise control over anger. Don't believe me? Well, look at what Proverbs 29, 11 says. It says fools vent their anger. Did you catch that? Fools vent their anger but the wise quietly hold it back. Here's what this verse is teaching us, and there's many others more. And that is that anger is a decision. And this proverb says that a fool decides to give a full vent to their anger, but the wise, the godly, decides to quiet his anger, to control his anger. Now, that doesn't mean 
that wise people don't get angry. The truth is that we all get angry. And anger is not so much the problem. It's, listen to this, it's what we do with our anger that makes the difference. Notice what this proverb says. It says that a fool gives full vent, but that a wise person quiets it down, controls it. So the word of God teaches us that we can control anger, that we can overcome anger, that anger doesn't have to control and overcome us. And the question now becomes, well, how can we overcome? How can we take control over anger and not let anger control us? Well, we believe that we can do that by making three decisions. And last week, we saw the first one. The first decision to overcome anger is that we need to decide to acknowledge our anger and the cost it brings with it. The first decision you have to make is you have to decide to acknowledge your anger and the cost it has. And today we're going to talk about the second decision. The second decision is the following. is decide to identify the source of your anger. So first, we recognize that we get angry. And we recognize the cost, the damage that it, may, that it has. But second, we have to decide to identify why we get angry. Proverbs 19, 11 says the following. It says, a man's understanding makes him slow to anger. Can I read that once again? You know, sometimes we read the word of God and we don't really pay attention to it. So we miss the big uh, uh, lessons that he wants to give us. But, but let's read that slowly. Look at what it says. A man's understanding makes him slow to anger. You would think that maybe God could give us this supernatural power and we don't get angry anymore. And yes, there is some power that God gives us through the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is self-control. But Proverbs also teaches us that our understanding can help us to slow and control our anger. So the key to anger is understanding the source of it. The more you know yourself, the more you know what ticks you off, the more you know what bothers you, the more you will be able to control your anger. You know, anger is an outer sign of something that is happen happening on the inside. Anger lets you know that there's something that you can't see and maybe can't touch, but that you need to pay attention to. It's kind of like the check engine in your car's dashboard. When the check engine turns on, it's to let you know that there's something wrong with your car. The check engine is not what's wrong. The check engine light tells you that something is wrong but then you need to take the time to find out what's wrong. I remember in one occasion seeing that somebody had covered the check engine light with some black tape. And they said, you know, if I can't see it, then the problem doesn't exist. Now let me tell you that we can't do that with anger. Anger lets us know that there's something inside that needs our attention. And there are reasons why you and I get angry. And to calm our anger, we need to know what those reasons are. What are the things that just tick us and cause us to explode in our anger? Let me introduce you to some of the reasons, to some of the, 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 the things that trigger anger in us. The first reason why we get angry is because of learned habits. Yes, listen to this. Anger is learned. And the number one source of anger is the bad habits that we have learned. We don't typically think of anger in that way, but it's true. Anger is learned. Now, let me clarify what I mean by that. The feeling of anger is not learned. What we learn is what we do when we get angry and how we get angry. We learn how we express that anger. And we learn it from our parents. We learn it from our family members. We learn it from our friends. We learn it from people we look up to. And when we see them deal with anger, then we maybe unintentionally or unconsciously adopt that behavior and we start 
responding to anger and treating anger the same way. And you know, we've all learned some negative habits from our parents, from our family. And there's certain ways of thinking, there's certain mental patterns, there's certain behaviors that, are, that have been learned from the people around us. Proverbs 22, verse 24 and 25, tell us the following. Look at what it says. It says, don't befriend angry people. In other words, don't become friends with angry people. Or associate with hot-tempered people. Or, look at this, pay attention to this, here's why. Or you will learn, you will learn to be like them and endanger your soul. We're told in this proverb that we need to avoid having friends, that we need to avoid having in our circle people who are angry, people who are hot-tempered. Why? Because anger is learned. And as I mentioned, we've all learned bad habits regarding anger at different extents, but we've all been exposed to wrong ways of dealing with anger. And maybe the way you vent your anger is by yelling or throwing tantrums or hitting or insulting or throwing things or making it or making life difficult for others. Or maybe you're passive aggressive as we saw last week. Or maybe you vent your anger by acting like a victim and blaming others or criticizing, slandering, gossiping, or even retaliating. You can vent your anger by having bad moods and threatening people and punishing people with your silence and your indifference. And if we do these things, it's very likely because We've picked them up from someone, from somewhere. And we don't only learn how to vent our anger, but we've also learned to use anger as a weapon. Many people use anger as a weapon. They know that if they get angry, others give way to them. Others submit to their desires. People know that if they get angry, they can make others feel bad. That people know that if you get angry, you can ruin a meeting, you can ruin a party. But see, although using anger as a weapon can lead to momentary uh, victories in the long run, in the end, anger only produces pain, destruction, separation, resentment, bitterness, loneliness, and sadness. So it's important that we recognize how we express our anger. Because once you understand that you've learned it, then you can be more empowered to change it. The second source of anger is living without margins. It's not just learned behaviors, but it's also living without margins. Look at what Isaiah 5, 8 tells us. It says, woe to you who add house to house and join field to field till no space is left and you live alone in the land. The prophet Isaiah here is talking about people who were using up the whole land and they were treating it in such a way where they were leaving no margins. They were leaving no space. There was no room left for anyone else. And I want you to notice what he says, it says that they did it in such a way that they ended up living alone in the land. You know, there's a very important life principle that you need to understand. And I want to challenge you, invite you to embrace it in your life. And it's counterintuitive to the American dream, to the American culture. And this life principle is that we can't consume. We can't use up everything. That we have to live with margins in our life. That we can't have a mentality of use it all, waste it all, eat it all, have it all. What are margins? Well, I'm glad you asked. You're very smart people. Margins are the space between you and the edge. Between you and a limit. Let me give you an example of what a margin is. A margin, for example, is that if you're able to handle six commitments per week and you commit to only four, well, you have a margin of six because your capability is six, 
but you're only using four, so you have a margin of two. Let me give you a financial example. In your finances, if you earn $1,000 per week and you spend 900, well, you have a margin of $100. And see, when we have margins and something unexpected happens, because we have room, we're able to bear it. We're able to deal with it properly. If you're committed to four things and something unexpected happens and a commitment is put upon you, you have a margin of two commitments, so you're able to handle it. If you normally spend $900 and there's an emergency, there's an unexpected expense, and you have to spend an extra $50, well, it's not going to affect you because you have a margin of 100 Now, check this out. You got to lean in for this. The problem is that many of us don't have margins. We're living lives without margins. If we can handle six commitments, what do we do? We fill up all six spots. If we make $1,000, what do we do? We spend all $1,000. And when we don't have margins, life will throw curveballs at you. Life will throw unexpected things your way. And if you don't have a margin, you're going to move to the negative side of things. And listen, many of us, not only do we not have margins in our schedule, not only do we not have margins in our finances, many of us, we don't have margins in our emotional life. We're overextended. We're doing too many activities. We have too many obligations and we have too much pressure. We're overloaded with too many demands, with too much work, with too much information and with too many things going on. And we're constantly living at the limit of our emotional capacity. And when you live at the limit of your emotional capacity, here's the danger. The danger is that you're a ticking bomb. You're a ticking bomb that anything will set it off. And when you don't have margins, it's like living at the edge of a cliff. And any little motion, any little movement can throw you over the edge. And because we don't have emotional margins... That's why we end up getting angry so easy. Something as insignificant as not agreeing where to eat can lead us to exploding in anger and rage. A small family problem, a small setback at work, bad news, a simple mistake by one of your kids. And what do we do? Most people end up getting angry. You know, it's, it's like when the wife says to the husband, honey, can you please throw out the trash? And if you are not living with emotional margins, you're going to explode and you're going to respond and say, woman, what's wrong with you? You can't see me resting. You just simply hate to see me resting. Or it's like when the husband says, honey, is dinner ready? And because the wife is not living with emotional margins, she explodes in anger and she says, yes, master, I am here to serve you and to plead your wishes. And when we don't have emotional margins, anger is going to be what we're going to be prone to do. We're going to be susceptible to anger. So we need to make margins in our life. See, margins are important for a couple of reasons. Let me give you a few of them. Margins are important because it is in the margins that strong relationships are formed. It is in the margins where you can strengthen your marriage because you have time to, to spend with one another. You have time to invest in one another. It is in the margins that, that strong family relationships can be built because you can spend time with your kids because you have time to go to the park. You have time to sit down and do a puzzle with them. You have time to, without being hurried, to listen to them. Margins, it is in the margins that strong relationships are formed. But margins are also important because it is in the margins where we grow spiritually. It is in the margins that we grow spiritually. You know, sadly today, many Christians are living without fruit in their life. Without spiritual growth. Without grace and God's favor. And not because God is withholding it from them. But because they're too busy and they don't have time for God. 
because they don't have margins in their life. And it is only when we spend time with God that we can grow our relationship with God. You know, it pleases God when we put him first and we make time for him. And let me tell you a secret, and it's not so much a secret. When you please God, God is going to bless you. And you please God by making time to be with him. But most of us, we're not growing spiritually because we have no margins. We fill up our schedule. We overcommit ourselves and we don't leave any room. Margins are also important because it is in the margins where goodness lives. It is in margins where we can do good to others. Jesus said that the greatest, that the great were those who served others. And serving acts of kindness. They don't live in a busy schedule. They live in margins. Serving other gives our life meaning. And you know today it's common to hear. Well you know pastor. I'd love to be able to help. I'd love to be able to be of service. But I just have too much going on. And when we fail to serve. We rob ourselves of purpose in life. So what are the source of our anger? Learn habits, a life without margins. But the third source of anger is frustration. Yeah, and I think we can all agree with this, right? This is almost a no-brainer. Frustration produces anger. And we get frustrated when we make plans and those plans don't turn out the way we wanted them. We get frustrated when we were expecting something and something completely opposite is what turns out happening. We get frustrated when we are behind a slow person or we have to wait longer than we anticipated in line. You know, this pandemic has brought, has caused all kinds of frustrations. There's people who've lost their jobs, people who've lost great opportunities, people who've lost their businesses, people who've lost relationships. And all these negative changes, they, they produce frustration. And frustration can lead to anger. You know where we see anger as the result of frustration the most? When we're driving. It's what we call road rage and we have road rage because people are so frustrated they're in such a hurry that any little thing somebody maybe not putting a signal or somebody maybe not taking the yellow light can cause frustration in us and what do, how do we respond well we respond by getting angry and see here's the thing frustration is always going to be part of life frustration is going to be part of our everyday and we have to learn, we have to decide that even when frustration is present, that we're not going to give in to anger. That we're not going to vent our anger. The fourth source of anger is unresolved issues. Learn habits, a life without margins, frustrations, but fourth, unresolved issues. You know, when issues in our life don't get addressed, when they get swept under the rug, when they get put to the side, they not only end up resurfacing, but they end up hurting us in the long run. Unresolved issues don't disappear. They resurface at the most inopportune moments. It could be an expression, it could be a word, it could be an attitude or a circumstance that can trigger that issue and bring that issue to the surface. You know, I always tell single people, I just tell them, you know, the best advice I can give you to finding a, a mate, to finding a husband, a wife, is not to look for the perfect wife, to look for the perfect person, but instead to become the right person. Many people believe, you know, if I just find the right person, I'm going to be good. Well, more than finding the right person, you got to be the right person. And one of the things you need to do if you want to be the right person is you got to address your issues. Let me talk to the single people. And I, I didn't have this in my notes. The Holy Spirit is leading me to share this because obviously somebody needs to hear it. See, if you don't address your issues, 
The issues that you blame your parents for right now, you'll blame them on your spouse when you get married. Because unresolved issues don't disappear. Look at what Numbers 32, 23 tells us. And you may be sure that your sin will find you out. Now, here's what you need to know. At times, God is going to be what brings these issues to the surface. Not because he's mean, not because he's bored, but because God wants you to be a whole healthy person. And unless you address these issues, and sometimes we won't address them unless they resurface, God is going to bring them up to the surface because he wants to heal you. He wants to change your character. He wants to improve you. So what are some of those unresolved issues that often result in anger? Well, the first of those unresolved issues is unresolved wounds. The first that we see in this area is unresolved wounds. Hurt produces anger. Anger can be a manifestation of emotional or physical pain. Have you ever, have you ever been uh, maybe nailing something or trying to, or using a hammer and you end up hitting one of your fingers with a hammer? How do you respond? Come on, let's be honest. I know we, we want to be godly, but, but let's be honest. We, we, we don't respond after we hit our thumb by praising the Lord. Most of us, we get angry. I get angry. I'm honest with you. This week, I was walking through my living room and I happened to hit my toe in the couch. And it hurt. And it hurt bad. And I started jumping around and I got angry. I didn't cuss. I didn't throw anything. But I did get angry. Because hurt produces anger. And you know, for many people, much of their anger is due to past hurts, to emotional wounds from their childhood, to wounds of mistreatment, to scars from a bad relationship, hurt from an abuse or, or a rejection or abandonment. And if these wounds are not addressed if they're not resolved. Every time someone does something that reminds you of what happened in the past, you're going to respond with anger. The second unresolved issue is insecurity. Not just unresolved wounds, but also insecurity. And insecure people, listen to this, get angry very easily I and mean, you hadn't thought about that but insecure people get angry very easily insecure people get angry when somebody attacks them when somebody criticizes them when they feel some form of fear when someone threatens them when somebody puts them down when somebody embarrasses them and they get angry because insecure people can't stand these things so how do they respond? They respond with anger. Let me tell you that when you have a sense of personal worth, you can deal with these things. It doesn't mean you don't feel them, but you're not overcome by them. When you know who you are, what others say doesn't really affect you. It doesn't really matter. In fact, look at what Ecclesiastes 7.21 tells us. It says, do not pay attention to every word people say. Now, we can't go to the other extreme where we shun people out of our lives that we live in this makeup island on our own. No, the Bible tells us that we are to live in community. But we are to live in the right perspective in community. And while we need to be open to the correction of others, we also need to understand that there's going to be people who attack us, who are going to criticize us, who are going to threaten, who are going to belittle, who are going to embarrass us simply because they want to hurt you. And when people do these things, they don't have your best version in mind. They don't have the wholeness of you in mind. They are focusing, they are looking 
at one part, and in many cases, at the worst possible part of who you are. They're focusing on your mistakes, on your weaknesses. So here's what you need to do. Don't pay attention to that. Don't pay attention to that. We need to be able to remember what God says about us. We get angry when we're insecure. When what others say matters more than what we know God says about us, that's going to make us insecure. And we're going to respond with anger. You know, somebody put it this way. They said, if you're wrong, you have no defense. And if you're right, you don't need a defense. So how can we become a more secure person? Proverbs 14, 26 gives us the answer. It says, he who fears the Lord is secure in confidence. He who fears the Lord is secure in confidence. Security, personal worth, personal uh, confidence comes from God. We are a secure person when we know and when we believe and when we anchor our lives in what God says about us. You want to know what the truth is about you? The truth about you is not what people say. It's what God says. But the problem is that many of us, we believe more what people say than what God says about us. Listen, even Jesus was the object of criticism. Even Jesus was the object of bad conversations. You know, they accused Jesus of being a drunk. They accused him of being a friend of sinners, of being a fake, and even a blasphemer. But here's what we see Jesus doing. Jesus did not give much importance to those conversations. He did not allow those words to set in his life. Why? Because Jesus was secure in what the Father had said about him. And if you remember at the baptism of Jesus, the Father said, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. So because Jesus was secured in who he was, and who he was was based on what the Father said. When people talked bad about him, when people used it, when people said wrong things about him, he didn't get angry. So here's, here's just some food for thought. The next time you get mad, think, ask yourself, could it be that I'm an insecure person? We'll leave it at that. Here's the last unresolved issue that can sometimes uh, be the source of our anger. And the last unresolved issue is our spiritual condition. Is our spiritual condition. Ephesians 6.12 says the following. Here's a very well-known verse. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. You know, what we often overlook, what we often don't think of, is where the main solution lies. Paul says in this verse that our struggle is not against people. He says that our real struggle is in the spiritual realm, not so much in the physical realm. That our biggest battle is not against our spouse or our kids or the old lady driving really slow in traffic. That your fight, that my fight is primarily, first and foremost, against Satan, the enemy of our soul. Now, he happens to be an opportunistic person who uses certain times and certain people to have his way. And he uses certain times and people so that we can focus our anger on people. But the text says that our fight is not against flesh and blood. But it is against the spiritual forces behind the curtains. And see, many of us, we may have never thought about this, but many of us, we get angry because our spiritual life is very poor. Because it may be non-existent. And because our spiritual life may not be what it needs to be. We may be fighting 
the wrong enemy using the wrong weapons. And we can resolve to anger because our spiritual life is lacking. You know, the Bible says that Adam, the father of mankind, was created by God, physically alive and spiritually alive. He had breath, but his spirit was also alive. But after the fall, after the original sin, every other human being was born alive, but spiritually dead. Because the wages of sin is dead. So what died at the very moment was their spirit. Their spirit. So they were, from now on, they were born spiritu uh, spiritually dead, but physically alive. But you know, that's why Jesus came. To give us life and give us life in abundance. And when we receive the gift that is Jesus Christ, he offers us that spiritual life. He not only gives us a better physical life, but he gives us spiritual life. And when our spirit is awakened, then everything in our life is illuminated. Everything in our life is seen for what it is. You're able to understand God. You're able to know God because your spirit is alive. The Bible says that the natural man does not and cannot understand spiritual things. But when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we're able to understand them. Because our spirit comes alive. And our life and our eyes are illuminated. And see, it is that spiritual life that will give you the foundation to overcome anger, fear, worry, anxiety, and depression. And that is what God offers you through Jesus Christ. And that is why we need Jesus. And if you've already made Jesus your Lord, well, you need to anchor yourself deeper, stronger in him. But if you have not received him, I think today is a good day for you to open your life, for you to receive the gift of life from God that is found in Jesus. And before we end, I believe that the Holy Spirit is going to work. But you also need to take the time to consider and understand yourself. Remember, we read that Proverbs that it says a man understanding helps him to control his anger. So you need to pay attention to the Holy Spirit as he shows you and instructs you what are the things that trigger the things that cause you to get angry. But before we dismiss, I'd love to give an opportunity to those of you that need Jesus in their life today. And if that's you, I want to invite you to make this prayer of faith where you open your heart and you receive him. Right there where you are, you can do that. And God will hear you. God will know you. And I believe that if you mean it, and if you believe it in faith, that you today can receive eternal life, spiritual life. Would you repeat after me and say, Heavenly Father, I come to you because I need you. I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I believe that he died on the cross to pay for my sins and that he offers me eternal life. I receive this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you made that prayer, I want to congratulate you and let you know that now the Spirit of God lives in you and that the Word of God says that you are a new creation. We would love for you to get in touch with us. You can visit our website. You can call our offices. We would love to know your name. We would love to put a Bible in your hands. But most importantly, if you have received Jesus, we encourage you to keep connecting with us, to keep connecting to the church so that together we can continue to learn and love God every time more and more. Well, church, until next Sunday, may the peace of God guard your hearts and mind and may his joy be your strength. We love you. God bless you.